Uh, I'm Paul Webley. Uh, I'm the director of SAIS. I'd like to welcome uh, all of you in the audience here tonight, particularly those of you who have travelled a long way to be here, and to Professor Nyla Kabir's husband, friends and colleagues. We've got guests from many institutions here tonight. Uh, some people have travelled a long way to be here. I won't list them all, but just to say that we really appreciate you all coming. Uh, SAIS inaugurals have a really nice atmosphere. Today we've got a very full house, uh, which is a tribute to uh, what everyone's looking forward to, which is Nyla's lecture. Uh, and it's great to see everyone here. SAIS inaugurals uh, a ceremony. It's a rite de passage for the uh, speaker. Nyla said to me earlier that actually what she was looking forward to was the food afterwards. <laughs> what we're all looking forward to, Nyla, is what you're going to tell us. Uh, but it's also a celebration, uh, and it's an enjoyable intellectual event. Now, to make sure that we all enjoy it, can I ask you all to turn off your mobile phones? And I always forget to do this myself, so... Here I am, modelling good behaviour for you. Oh, God. <laughs> Trying to model good behaviour. I still haven't managed it. <coughs> Hooray, right, OK. My phone is now switched off. I hope everyone else's is. Um, the other thing just to say about housekeeping is... The fire exits are the places where it says fire exit. Uh, we're not expecting a fire alarm. So if there is a fire alarm, could you please leave in an orderly fashion out of the fire exits? Uh, I'm really pleased to preside over this inaugural lecture, first one of 2013, the fourth of the 2012-13 series. You'll hear more about Nyla Kabir from Professor Anne Whitehead in a moment, so I'm not going to say anything about him. Just to say, Nyla, how pleased we were uh, when you agreed to join SOAS, because SOAS seems to me a natural home for you. Uh, and if you want to know more about her, she's got an absolute brilliant website, uh, nylakabir.com. So, you'll, Anne will tell you something, but if you want to know more, go to the website. Emeritus Professor Anne Whitehead will introduce Professor Kabir tonight. She's a professor of anthropology at the University of Sussex and a professor of social anthropology at the Sussex Centre for the Migration Centre Research and Centre for Gender Studies. I hope I got that right. And her research and policy interventions have been mainly in the fields of gender, poverty and development. And she carried out research uh, through the Migration, Globalisation and po Poverty DRC at the University of Sussex on internal and regional migration, links between poverty, livelihoods of migration, independent child migration, and on gender and generational issues. She also specialises in the collection and interpretation of qualitative and life history data. And we're very grateful to you, and for coming here this evening to introduce Nyla. The vote of thanks will be given by Professor Denise Candiotti, who's very well known uh, to here at SOAS. Like me, uh, Professor Candiotti was educated in the social psychology department at LSE. She's had a very interesting career doing work, first on political economy and rural transformation, then gender nationalism and Islam. From 69 to 80, Denise worked at universities in Turkey, but then she saw the light, moved to England, and took up a position at SOAS. She's been a stalwart of SOAS, She's been the key to the development of expertise in Central Asia. And one of the things I really am pleased about, she's played an absolutely vital role in developing the next generation of scholars. So, we're very grateful to them both for being part of today's event. Afterwards, as I've already hinted, there is some food, so you'll be invited upstairs to a reception in the Brunel Suites for some wine and uh, canapes. So at the end of the lecture, you know what to do. You then all leave upstairs. That's where the food is. So to introduce Professor Kabir, I'll pass over to Professor Whitehead. Over to you, Anne. Not only is it an honour to make this introduction to Nyla's inaugural, it is also a great pleasure. I find that I have now known Nyla for nearly 30 years. This is very hard to believe. Not least because I think of Nyla as very much younger than me, which of course she is, but the evidence tells me that we are beginning to approach being in the same generation 
as far as the young are concerned. So 30 years almost, and how hugely exciting, challenging, intellectually rewarding and fun she has made those years. I met Nyla in 1985, when she was first appointed to the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex. She had then recently completed her economics PhD at the LSE after her undergraduate and master's degrees there, also in economics. Her PhD was an early and personally significant indication of her rebellious intellect. It required considerable persuasion to get her economics teachers to sanction her study of fertility children and the household economy in rural Bangladesh, especially as she chose to do village field research. When she arrived at IDS, the gender work there was gradually being expanded under the leadership of Kate Young. And Nyla and I were immediately drawn into a range of joint gender and development activities then going. They were going on in and between the University of Sussex, where I was in the anthropology department, and IDS. It was also soon after this that she joined the editorial collection of Feminist Review, a specifically socialist feminist journal. And this provided another altogether very different arena for our joint activities. Since these early contexts, Nyla and I have maintained an ongoing intellectual engagement in numerous structured and unstructured ways. Our direct professional contact has been through teaching, training, and very occasionally joint writing, where I learnt firsthand not only what an exhilarating thinker she is, but what a hard worker. Nyla has opened many worlds to me and in many ways but perhaps particularly through our joint participation in all those numerous workshops and events, either organized by Nyla or for which a piece of Nyla's work has been a catalyst and where some key gender and development issue has been discussed and argued over with a variety of other scholars and practitioners. These conversations and arguments have for me provided a constant and profound intellectual stimulus and excitement as they must have had for many. But I have particularly prized their character as interdisciplinary dialogues. Interdisciplinarity is a complex beast. It has huge merits in relation to gender and development as a field of study for social change. And for me, the best possible learning about how to do it has been through my conversations, direct and indirect, with Nyla. Conversations from our initially apparently very different starting points, she as an economist and me an anthropologist. During this time, Nyla has become a deservedly international renowned gender and development specialist and one of the most influential thinkers in the field. She's made outstanding contributions to developing the intellectual field of gender and development to changing the face of many areas of development theory, but she has also genuinely opened up many pathways for improving women's lives in the majority world. She's a most exciting professorial appointment for SOAS, where she joins the Development Studies Department of long-standing influence and distinction. In coming to think about making this introduction, I have found it exceedingly hard to summarize the range, the extent, and sheer number of her research areas and publications, or to give a concise account of the intensity and extent of her international engagement. So what I want to do instead is to spend a few minutes looking back at the first 10 to 15 years of her work when she was at IDS, in order to look for clues as to how Nyla was to become, to emerge, as such a powerful, incisive, and influential public intellectual, and such an effective and eloquent advocate for gender justice, particularly in the majority world. 
It's clear to me that, in retrospect, that IDS in the late 1980s and through the 1990s was absolutely the right place for her. As aid and development had come to characterize one of the major ways in which Britain adapted to its post-colonial global position and to the rigid structure of the international relations of the Cold War, IDS was playing a crucial role in the evolution and application of theoretical ideas about development. It provided itself on being at the cutting edge of theory and concepts, on its interdisciplinarity, and its role in putting ideas into practice through its links with the UK and other governments and with global institutions. It had some of the brightest and best development thinkers. And of course, with very few exceptions, these were men. This is not a cheap point. For the social sciences in general were at that time not only themselves the sites of gender inequality, they had huge difficulty in finding ways to think about gender issues. The invisibility of gender and women within development studies was chronic, nowhere more so than at the IDS, despite the little enclave of gender work that had been fought for there. As Nyla describes in the preface to Reverse Reality, a wonderful book published in 1994, her intellectual agenda at that time was to explore how feminist analysis of mainstream social science ideas applied to development studies, hence its subtitle, Gender Hierarchies in Development Thought. The twin experiences of the institutional basis of male power and privilege in both the IDS and in the Bangladeshi village of her PhD pushed her with characteristic energy and vigor to make sense, gosh, I've made a, to make sense in reverse realities of how theory, concepts, and practice contributed to the intellectual absence of any gender analysis in development studies and its consequent failures in relation to women's lives. Reversed Realities is, really is an astounding work and thoroughly deserves its place as the most read, most cited, and most influential book on gender and development. It contains incisive analysis of the ways in which economics was unable to address gender issues. It develops a distinctive array of gender relational conceptual tools and explores the development practice of a wide array of development actors, including those she describes as unofficial. Rereading it just now, I found it shows well the hallmarks of all Nyla's subsequent work. Summarizing madly, these are a very sharp mind, a refusal to accept theory, concepts, or representations of empirical reality at face value a powerful drive to develop conceptual tools that will do a much better job of making theory do the work of analyzing the gendered empirical world about which she has an insatiable curiosity. More, on, more informally, I particularly prize in Nyla's work are she is utterly fearless in her theorizing and critiquing, utterly fearless. I'm sure she doesn't think so, but that what it, that's what it looks like from the outside. She is prepared to do unlimited amounts of slog. Her work is not only thoroughly empirically grounded, but the areas of empirical evidence she draws on are extraordinarily wide-ranging, from international and national statistics, statistics through careful quantitative case studies and a myriad of qualitative and ethnographic evidence. And finally, of course, I prize her work because of its commitment to social change through pol policy and action. As I said, one of the dimensions to reverse realities was its emphasis on development institutions and development actors. Her engagement with these was, of course, encourages, encouraged by, IDO, sorry, by IDS's own institutional mandate. A significant thing that Nyla did in her early years there was to take a three-month IDS residential training course called Men, Women, and Development and put it on a firm theoretical and conceptual foundation. Out of this came a highly influential gender training framework, 
the core of which showed practitioners at all levels how to analyze gender power within a structural framework, a structured framework of key social institutions. Nyla and her colleagues use this framework for gender training around the world within development institutions of all kinds, from the World Bank to local NGOs and grassroots feminist organization. As Nyla describes it to me, it was this that laid the basis for her subsequent policy-based research and advocacy in partnership with a host of the world's major global, national, and local development institutions. The early years at IDS also saw the beginning of Nyla's interest in women and work. She had to make several grant applications, younger scholars please note, before she succeeded in getting the funds for her study of the garment workers in Dakar and London, which resulted in the justly acclaimed book, The Power to Choose, Bangladeshi Women Workers' Labor Market Decisions in Dakar and London. This was published in 2001. This is a profoundly important book for a number of reasons not least because it centers on the issue of human agency, specifically women's agency. Its sophisticated account is thoroughly grounded in the reality of women's lives, and its analysis powerfully derives from talking to women, the unofficial development actors or reversed realities. It was only very recently that I came to understand some of the part that Nyla's PhD fieldwork research has played in her intellectual formation. When I discovered that she spent 18 months living in the village she was researching, 18 months as an, econ as an economist, it's an extraordinarily long period of immersion. <laughs> as I see it, it gave her a deep understanding of the complex complexity of what needs to be explained and changed in women and men's lives, and hence, of course, of what needs to be explained and understood. But it also gave her the confidence to talk to all women and to see that it is from the unofficial actors in development processes that one can seek answers. A confidence that was put to such good effect in the research for the power to choose. It seems fitting then that Nyla has chosen as a subject for her inaugural lecture, reflections on researching women's empowerment, journeys, maps, and signposts, where women's own interpretations of their lives will loom large. Thank you very, very much, Annie. I'm very moved. And uh, not having had an inaugural in my life before, I am very grateful to SOAS for having organized this. Um, <clears throat> it's obviously uh, a little late in the day, but uh, better late than never. And I think I am going to enjoy it, especially the food and the wine afterwards. <laughs> <clears throat> and I'm also very grateful to Denise, who has come in from the warmth of Istanbul to be with us here to give the vote of thanks. Now, the reference to um, the journeys in the title of this talk, as some of you will have already guessed, uh, relates to two kinds of journeys. The idea of women's empowerment as a journey that they embark on is a recurring metaphor in the literature on this topic. And indeed, this metaphor of a journey is featured in a five-year research program uh, that we have, have recently been involved with that was called the Pathways of Women's Empowerment. But the metaphor of a journey I have also used to capture my own attempts to understand what the concept of empowerment means for women themselves in the different contexts in which they are located. There's both a professional and a personal motivation to this latter journey. By women themselves, I'm talking about those women who feature in the secondary literature written by other feminist academics who work on empowerment but also on my own primary research, particularly that carried out in Bangladesh. I have drawn heavily on my fieldwork in Bangladesh for this talk, 
not surprisingly, because it is the one place outside the UK that I know best, and it is where I can carry out my interviews in a language other than English that is understood by those who I'm talking to. And I believe that one gains certain insights from this direct interaction with people in a context that one knows well. But my interest in researching women's empowerment is not purely professional. It is also motivated by my experience of growing up in a culture that devalues women on a daily and structural basis. So in a sense, it is also personal. Gender inequality is not unique to any particular region or country of the world, but it takes different forms with different consequences. I was born and brought up in the region of the world which Denise has characterized as the belt of classic patriarchy, which stretches from North Africa, across the Middle East, across the northern plains of uh, India to Bangladesh, and also includes East Asia. This is a region with, where principles of inheritance and descent are patrilineal. Men matter in property and in lineage. It is a region where there are strict controls over women's sexuality and their mobility in the public domain, restricting them to purely reproductive roles or to productive roles that can be carried out largely within the homes. These regions have some of the lowest female labor force participation rates in the world, although economic growth has made East Asia an exception now. Women must leave their homes when they marry to live in their husband's homes, often at a distance from where they were born and brought up, <clears throat> and where they arrive as stranger brides, and where their status is extremely low until they start to bear children, particularly sons. This is a region of strong son preference. It is also the region that Amartya Sen has described as characterized by high levels of missing women. Missing women refers to the fact that active gender discrimination and malign forms of neglect lead to much higher levels of mortality amongst women relative to men. And missing women are those women who are no longer there, women and girls, because of this discrimination. The estimates of the percentage of women, missing women in these populations may rest on some dry statistical calculations, but the causes behind them are a pervasive and taken for granted aspect of everyday existence of men and women who live in these regions. And while the overall disparity in mortality rates has declined in these regions, it seems to have been replaced in some countries by the phenomenon of missing daughters. Excess female mortality in the zero to five age group and combined with female selective abortion. As an only child, I never did find out what it would be like to be a daughter in a culture that valued sons. But I did grow up hearing from my mother that whenever her mother, my grandmother, was asked how many children she had, she would reply very proudly, I have six precious diamonds, six achamoti, by which she meant her six sons. Her daughters were never counted. So I grew up in a culture where not only did society treat women as inferior, but women themselves, women perceived themselves and treated each other as inferior. So my interest in researching women's empowerment stemmed from my desire to find out how this could be changed. It also explains why it is change in women themselves that I have been interested in, in women's gendered subjectivities which are, of course, acquired through the full set of social relationships in which they grow up, in which they participate. But as Denise has pointed out, gendered subjectivities in the Middle East, the area about which she is writing, and which applies to South Asia, gendered subjectivities are achieved as a byproduct of the most restrictive and oppressive controls over female sexuality. But they are not experienced as necessarily restrictive or oppressive simply as what it means to grow up to be a man or a woman in these contexts. So my concerns with, women empower, with women's empowerment has, all, has always begun with the issue of women's consciousness. Before I start working out how changes in women's consciousness might lead to changes in their rights as citizens. And I've always liked this particular quotation from my friend Shireen Haq, an activist in Bangladesh, that our experience of discrimination as women led us to demand fair treatment and respect 
for our dignity as human beings, and only thereafter to claim our rights and entitlements as citizens. When I first started thinking about gender issues as an aspect of my academic work, I was influenced by two poles within the social sciences. On the one hand, as Annie has mentioned, there was neoclassical rational choice theory uh, that I was learning in the classroom, the view that all our actions are motivated by rational calculations about our self-interest, subject, of course, to how much purchasing power we have at our disposal. The other pole was constituted by sweeping structural narratives, Along with theories of Marxism and modernization that were battling it out in development studies, there was an equally sweeping strand of literature that invoked ideas about the patriarchy to explain the subordinate status of women. There was very little interest in gendered subjectivities within any of these narratives. What people thought was assumed to be determined by their culture and tradition, by their relationship to the means of production, or by their position in the patriarchal order. My efforts to navigate my way through these different poles <coughs> began when I decided, much to the horror of my supervisor at the time, that I would spend 18 months in a village in Bangladesh doing field work. Now, you have to understand, this was a very odd decision, because as someone who'd been trained in economics, uh, it was strange for an, uh, other economists to think that you might actually go and do your own field work and collect your own data, um, since they generally rely on other people's data and large data sets. But I was influenced by the work of anthropologists who were working in this field at, on, on these issues, people like Ben White and Mead Kane, and I wanted to do what they did. However, I hadn't been trained to do what they did. So basically, I spent 18 months in the field collecting quantitative data. But talking to people, I talked to a lot of people, and I got a sense of village life. I got a sense of a life that had so far been very distant from me as a middle-class urban person. And what I did, I suppose, during those 18 months, um, beyond collecting data, was to compile a cultural inventory of what patriarchy looked like in Bangladesh. So it took me a little bit away from the abstractions of rational choice theory and a little bit closer to uh, a much more empirically informed understanding. But my analytical efforts still lacked actual people. It focused on structures and read off motivations from these structural principles. The views and the voices of the men and women that I had talked to during those 18 months, and I clearly talked to many, I didn't know how to incorporate them into my PhD research. It was when I joined the Institute of Development Studies at Sussex after my PhD that I began to understand what qualitative insights might look like. And it helped to carve out a very different analytical terrain in which I've worked ever since. The work of Sussex was influenced by critical anthropologists like Anne Whitehead, Hilary Standing, who's here, who used the rich tradition of ethnographic fieldwork as a tool of methodological inquiry, not only to challenge the colonial mindsets that dominated their own disciplines, but also to build an alternative understanding of economics to the one that I had been taught one that focused less on men and women as individuals and much more on their relationships and the positions that they occupied in them. It was this analytical framework that informed my first research project as an independent researcher, the, what became the power to choose. The project itself was motivated by what appeared to be a paradox. Bangladesh was portrayed in the literature of the time as characterized by poverty, patriarchy, and parda, and many, many pregnancies. Um, very conservative, no tradition of female uh, labor force participation, uh, strict controls over women's mobility because of parda. Yet within a few years of my completing my field work, <clears throat> we found that the streets of Bangladesh were now uh, packed but with young women going to work to the newly emerging garment factories export-oriented garment factories. Now, these women appear to be competing very directly for jobs in the global market for garments with women in the clothing industry in, Bangladesh, in, in Britain, much of it located in the east end of London, with workers drawn largely from the Bangladeshi community settled here. While many of the workers in London were Bangladeshi women, and some of the people who worked with me there are here, over there, um, <clears throat> While many of them were women, none of them worked in the factories and workshops that made up the garment industry in London. 
It was the Bangladeshi men who worked in the workshops. Women worked from home on a piece rate basis in apparent compliance with Parda norms. So the paradox for me was why was it in a conservative country like Bangladesh, women were going out in the factories, and in a so-called progressive country like the UK, women were working at home. Of course, the paradox, like many paradoxes, is less puzzling once you look more closely at it, but it was the motivation for this research. And I decided to do something which I think at the time was quite novel. I decided to take economic theories of labor supply decision making and subject it to an ethnographic method. In other words, I would ask people how they made their decisions and what motivated them, what, how they made, you know, who resisted, et cetera, et cetera. And it seemed to me I, I could use their life histories both to get a sense of the context in which they were making decisions, but also how they perceived their choices, whether they saw them as choices, and how they experienced the consequences of their choices. In other words, I was asking them, though I'm not sure I phrased it that way, if they felt empowered by their experience of paid work. The concept of empowerment was just about emerging when I started this research. It was an important addition to existing analysis of power within the feminist literature, which had focused mainly on power in terms of male domination. As Amy Allen put it, the concern with empowerment does not rule out acknowledgement of male power, but it puts the focus on a, a different notion of power, the power as the ability to transform oneself, others, and the world. The idea of asking people for their own accounts of what they did was, in fact, quite novel for an economist. Mainstream economists are notoriously reluctant to ask people why they do what they do, although a lot of their uh, focus is on choice. And the reason they uh, are probably quite reluctant is they're not willing, they think that people will not be willing to own up to the kinds of narrow self-interests which neoclassical economists attribute to them. Similarly, sociologists often discount people's own explanations of their action because they believe that the, the assumption is that institutions and structures work behind the backs of social actors who therefore will not have any worthwhile understanding of the circumstances of their actions. Others have also questioned the idea that the stated perceptions of subordinated groups cannot be necessarily truths, complete truths, if they have internalized dominant values and hence appear to consent to their own subordinate status. I think Amartya Sen was one of the first economists I read who made this point about how people unconsciously adapt their perceptions of what is desirable to their perceptions of what is possible. All of these kinds of theories spoke to my concerns with understanding the subjective dimensions of empowerment. Coming from a culture in which women are expected to be dependent on men for much of their lives, uh, I did attach a great deal of importance to the material dimensions of gen uh, gender disempowerment and of the importance of women exercising some degree of independence. But as I said earlier, it seemed to me that there was something else that stood in the way of change, and this was women's apparent acceptance of their inferior status. My work on the garment workers was illuminating for me in a number of ways. It highlighted a conundrum within the paradox that I was researching that went something like this. If women's subordinate status within the Bangladeshi family was indeed underpinned by their dependence on the male breadwinner, then an access to an independent income of their own would threaten men's dominant position within the household and would always be met with male resistance. Indeed, many of the men in my sample appear to subscribe to this view, asserting that women who earned money became insubordinate. They did not feel so threatened in London where the kinds of money that women earned from home-based piecework were so irregular and so small that it didn't really threaten the domestic uh, hierarchy. But they were very threatened by the idea of women going out to factories to earn regular wages. And in fact, it became very evident that many more women might have been working in the factories if they had not been forbidden to do so by their husbands. So the conundrum was, if women's, women's wage work did indeed threaten male power, then how was it that so many women in Dhaka appeared to have gained male consent to their jobs? The answers that emerged to this question illuminated many aspects of the complex and contradictory nature of the process that made it possible and of the journey of empowerment that women had embarked on. It illuminated, first of all, that one 
set of resources that women had at their disposal were discursive. It was based on their very close understanding of the nature of the resistance that they faced and what it, what it was that concerned their husbands, their mothers, or their fathers. And because of the intimate relations of the family, etc., they were able to find a set of arguments that addressed precisely these concerns. I've put some of the quotes from these women up on the board uh, because they, they illustrate um, some of the changes that were going on. So the concerns that they addressed were concerns about uh, women's public visibility. They argued that their parda would remain intact um, because they would behave modestly in the public domain, that they would be working in a female-dominated environment, that earnings were necessary for their family's welfare, their children's future, and in the case of husbands, that they would not neglect their domestic duties. Many handed their wages back to their husbands, arguing, as it is he has let me work, how would he feel if I kept the wages? There were a number of other findings that stayed with me from that study. One was the importance of the outside environment in shaping what was going on within the home. It wasn't simply the availability of factory work versus piecework in London and Dhaka that made the difference, but also the nature of the labor market for men, uh, the existence of a welfare state in the UK, um, and the cultural organization of the workplace, whether it brought women into contact with others like themselves or other kinds of women who might uh, give them ideas. This, the other major finding goes back to this objective. It was clear that it was not simply the objective fact of factory work that distinguished the impact of work on women's lives in Dhaka, but also the conditions under which they took up this work. For those women who had been forced to take up this work by the death of a husband or the loss of a male breadwinner, it did not feel like a choice. It was an optionless choice. They had to work in order to survive, but this not, was not what they wanted from their lives. But for those others, for him, it represented an expansion of their uh, options. These jobs were extremely valuable and they fought hard to get them. Um, shifts were taking place in power relations within the household below the surface, even as women sought to maintain the fiction that nothing had changed. So if Households were, as economists were now acknowledging, sites of cooperative conflict. It was their cooperative aspects that shaped negotiations among family members, leading them to give up something in order to gain something. It was only when conflict came out in the open, as it did in some cases, that it became clear that there had been an important shift in power relations, that women now had an exit option. This exit option was most often exercised when they found out that their husbands had taken on second wives without telling them or even with telling them, or when their husbands failed to fulfill their roles as male breadwinners. Domestic violence, interestingly, did not appear to constitute sufficient cause for women to walk out on marriages. The fact that power relations within the Bangladesh household operate primarily through implicit acknowledgments of change rather than explicit bargaining means, and this is within a context of a shared ideology about cooperation and complementarity, means that effect, attempts to, to capture changes in power relations on the basis of a very individualized notion of empowerment often misses the point. This is very clearly illustrated in the growing literature uh, attempting to measure and capture women's empowerment in the context of microfinance. Um, one study, for instance, interpreted the fact that men were using the loans that were intended for women as evidence that women had no control over these loans. Another study said the fact that women who had access to microcredit were more likely to report joint decision-making rather than male decision-making was not evidence of change because we all knew that in Bangladesh, joint decision-making is simply a disguise for male dominance. And yet, my own interviews with, garment, with the microfinance beneficiaries <clears throat> found that what outsiders valued was not necessarily what women valued themselves. They did not attach the same degree of value to individualized forms of control over resources, particularly in a context where the possibilities opened up by individualized control in rural areas in Bangladesh was very limited. They could not walk out on their husbands. While some of them utilized the loans themselves, some of them were forced to hand over their loans to their husbands, sharing their loans with sons and husbands did not carry connotations of loss. 
What they cared about much more was the extent to which the profit from the loans were used in ways that they approved of. Similarly, in a society women are marginalized by from decision making, it is unlikely that change will happen overnight as a shift from male-dominated decision-making to female-dominated decision-making. We would expect the change to take place as a move from the margins to a more shared role in decision-making, rather than seeing the shared role in decision-making as a disguise for male dominance. So the language of autonomy that has featured very prominently in some of the literature on women's empowerment seems particularly ill-suited to capturing how processes of empowerment have unfolded in the lives of Bangladeshi women. It may be that in the more individualized societies of the West, the search for autonomy makes some kind of sense. Paula England, for instance, has suggested that rising access to employment by women in the US since the 50s and the rise in the rates of single motherhood and divorce are not coincidence. Women use employment to get out of unsatisfactory marriages. But in contexts where households are organized around corporate lines, where women are denied a great deal of agency in the public domain, Divorce is not necessarily the first option. Instead, in these situations of unequal interdependence, they seek greater equality rather than greater independence. Anwar gave me an opportunity to pull some of these ideas together, and I won't go through this uh, in the, because of time constraints, but basically, it helped me to try and conceptualize empowerment in terms of women's capacity to exercise agency not just observed agency, but also the sense of agency that they bring to their actions, and also collective forms of agency, which feminists have valued. Uh, choice as exercised through access to important resources, material, associational, and social, and achievements. What are you able to achieve through the resources and agency at your disposal? A sense of achievement is the, the exercise of a, 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 the achievement issue is less about actually achieving what you want, but much more about being willing to attempt to change things. So the, the issue of achievement is more about giving women a sense of agency, a sense of change, than about actually winning the gains that you're looking for. But one of the things that has remained um, very interesting is in all the research that I was doing, we found very little evidence of collective action. And in the next piece of research, which was the Pathways of Women's Empowerment, we decided to quantify uh, the impact of work, of access to land, of uh, associations, of you know, collectivities and so on, and to ask ourselves to what extent did these access to resources impact on women's lives, not just within the household and uh, decision making, but also in terms of community participation and political participation, in terms of their perceptions of themselves and um, their place in society. And we looked at a number of resources that might make a difference. These are some of the pathways. Different categories of work as compared to economic inactivity, education, membership of associations, access to land, routine watching of television, whether they were valued by their families, and so on and so forth. And the indicators of empowerment included economic agency within the household, freedom of movement outside the household, in the case of Egypt and uh, Bangladesh, access to financial resources, position within family and uh, community, in how they were regarded by members of family and community, political agency, as measured by whether they had voted in local elections, and their attitudes, whether they thought they had some control over their lives or not. And in the case of Egypt and Bangladesh, their attitudes towards sons. I won't go into this again, because I, uh, how much time do I have left? 20. Pardon? 20. 20. 20. 20. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, the, the, this was done as a very quantitative um, uh, econometric study. We, we took the help of econometricians, uh, as I'm not one myself. And essentially, the, the, the sum of the story was that paid work empowered women in Egypt, Ghana, and Bangladesh much more than economic inactivity. However, within paid work, different categories of work mattered. Work outside the home 
And Anne Whitehead wrote many years ago about being outside the control of your kinship and family. So in that sense, work outside the home or off the farm was more empowering than work within the home. And finally, formal paid work was far more empowering than any other form of work. Now, so we can rank these diff the empowerment potential of these different kinds of work in terms of their income and security of working conditions, in terms of their potential for exposure to new ideas and relationships, and in terms of degree of control over earnings. But the background context to these findings is that in all three contexts, the kind of work that most empowered women was on the decline. Formal work, particularly formal public sector work, is been shrinking in all three countries. Less, more slowly in Egypt, which still has a massive public sector, but even in Egypt, we're seeing uh, a decline in public sector work. And only in Bangladesh have women gained any kind of a foothold in private formal work in the shape of the garment industries. And even here, the word, we use the word semi-formal because the conditions in the garment industries certainly do not resemble conditions in the public sector. Education, interestingly and perhaps boringly, proved to be very empowering in all three contexts. And this was not education via the job market, because we'd controlled for the job market. It was education through cognitive, relational, I, I'm not quite sure what. But certainly in Bangladesh, where we did qualitative research, women put a great deal of value on what education could offer you. They said education made you human. Education made you be able to plan and think. Secondly, um, only in Bangladesh did uh, ownership of housing and land prove important, but this may have to do a, a problem with how we measured it. But the other point I want to highlight is while the impact of individual resources like employment and education did spill over into the public domain in the community and voting, it did not lead to any increased collective action amongst women. In fact, so low was the extent of collective action in all three contexts that we dropped that as a variable. We didn't even bother trying to look at uh, what might influence it. Nor, with the exception of Bangladesh, was membership of association, did membership of association prove to be important. And even in Bangladesh, where it was largely NGOs, development NGOs, membership of NGOs did not facilitate collective action. In other words, even if changing attitudes and behavior might be leading in unobserved ways to unintended change in these countries, none of the resources, the education, work, NGO membership, church membership, etc., was leading to any kind of the purposive collective commitment to bringing about change that has featured in so many um, definitions of women's empowerment. The differences in the impact of the organizations in all three contexts is interesting. It suggests that the membership of groups organized by development NGOs in Bangladesh, most of them organized around microfinance, was more empowering than membership of the state-managed organizations that we found in Egypt, or than the church-based, faith-based organizations that we found in Ghana. So what was it about the development NGOs in Bangladesh that was having this impact? One thing we should point out is while they are funded by donors and accountable to donors, there is much more scope for independent activity in Bangladesh than there was in Egypt, and the values that development NGOs promote in Bangladesh are much have greater affinity to our indicators of empowerment than church-based, faith-based organizations in Ghana. There was Muslim and uh, Christian. But why did development NGOs have any impact at all? One point to make is that in a separate study of development NGOs in Bangladesh, we looked at the impact of different kinds of NGOs. And we located them on a continuum from narrow minimalist microfinance through to intermediate organizations that combine microfinance and social awareness building and so on, to social mobilization organizations. And we found that, as you might expect, narrow minimalist microfinance organizations have the least impact. 
But to this day, there are intermediate organizations like BRAC that provide microfinance but combine it with awareness raising, legal literacy, and so on. But the organizations that had the greatest impact were those that did not provide any services at all, those that specialized in social mobilization. And these uh, organizations in Bangladesh had the kind of impact that if we could scale it up, would really change the culture of governance in Bangladesh. It would be grassroots democracy challenging the structures of corruption that characterize governance in Bangladesh. But of course, social mobilization organizations are on the decline, along with the formal public sector, because the, the, the bang for the buck lies in microfinance. Financial sustainability lies in microfinance. Nobody wants to finance social mobilization because the impacts are so intangible. Now, <clears throat> research into these organizations tell us, the mo social mobilization organizations, tell us that they combine quite different kinds of resources which help to explain their collective impact, their impact in the public domain. There is the material dimension. They do not provide microfinance, but they do encourage women to, and men to save on a regular basis. And they train them in livelihood activities. They train them to bargain for better returns for their labor. So it's a different set of material resources. Then there are the cognitive dimensions. All of these organizations have been influenced by the work of Paulo Freire. And they all seek to uh, develop the critical consciousness of their members through interactive training and discussion groups, which encompass both everyday concerns as well as the nature of the society in which they live. It is very evident that some of these organizations are planting the seeds of de deliberative democracy, which is very clear in the emphasis put in the women's narratives on the exercise of reason, on local conflict resolution, on distinguish between, distinguishing between justice and injustice. And all of this is a contrast to complying with norms which had been their experience in the past. As this woman said, if a husband is beating the daylights out of his wife, five of us women go there and warn him not to make trouble, and they do. And husbands are embarrassed and shamed knowing that now their wives have this other collective forum in which to discuss their actions. It's no longer restricted to the private domain. And finally, there is the relational dimension. These organizations put a great deal of emphasis on regular meetings, regular discussions, building group solidarity, collecting funds together, and learning how to protest. So over time, women who may have known each other before they joined these groups anyway, the nature of their relationship changes. They are no longer see themselves as belonging to the given relationships of family, kinship, neighborhood, but as building chosen relationships in which they have a much greater say in what is at the heart of these chosen relationships. So as one woman said, one stick can be broken, but a bundle of sticks cannot. You cannot achieve anything on your own. You have no value on your own. So, as I said, there was very little evidence of collective action in our survey. To look for collective action, we have to be far more purposive. We have to focus on organizations. Collective action doesn't come spontaneously to the kinds of work that these women are doing, which is isolated, it goes for Ghana, Egypt, and Bangladesh, isolated, often home-based, very dispersed. What the development NGOs in Bangladesh, and particularly the social mobilization organizations are doing, are in a sense taking the role of trade unions, but using strategies that are tailored to local contexts, local constraints, and the local pace. And so as a part of the Pathways research, we've also worked and talked and discussed with people, other people who are organizing in the informal economy. And they range for people working with waste pickers, sex workers, domestic servants, Brazil, Ghana, um, Thailand, and so on. And their stories and their experiences and their strategies tell us what is at, how these organizations are able to offset their lack of confrontational power, which has characterized a great deal of old trade union action in the past. 
They tell us how these organizations put a great deal of thought on whether they're going to be registered as unions, whether they're going to be associations, or whether they're going to be unregistered. All of these choices have strategic consequences. They put a lot of effort into building a shared community which brings women together as workers and crosses their divide as from different caste or different legal status and so on. They use the resources of soft power, which is uh, publicity, information, including training their own members about their rights, but also informing the public about the kind of conditions in which women work. And with the farm, uh, working on farms in South Africa, women were brought to Tesco's meetings to talk to Tesco's shareholders about the kind of conditions that they were working under, and the shareholders have apparently made a commitment to improve them. They also put a great deal of emphasis, as I said, on the material imperatives. Uh, some of them will provide cooperatives, others will provide uh, loan facilities, but extremely important in all of their efforts is the search for social security, is seeking to be included in the social security provisions that exist in their countries. So whether it's in India with waste pickers wanting the municipality to give them a pension, sex workers wanting a pension, um, rural women in Brazil seeking to be included in social security arrangements, the issue of social security is clearly provides a firm ground on which these women can negotiate. Making the law work for women workers, once you have given women an, an, a knowledge of their rights, what the constitution says, etc., organizations have been able to support them in taking their cases to court. And their cases may be around uh, issues of sexual nature of rape in, uh, in Thailand, or it may be bread and butter issues around wages. But with the support of these organizations, women have found, these workers have found, that the law does not always work against them, that it can be made to wake, work for them. Uh, engaging in policy and politics. And my final point, I think, <clears throat> is that um, what, is, what is made, I think, these organizations, and all of these organizations have existed for a very long time. The ones I talked to in the social mobilization groups have been members for 10, 15, 20 years. These other organizations all have been working over a long time. And what that tells you about is the pace of change in the lives of marginalized groups. You cannot dictate the pace of change within a logical framework. You cannot dictate priorities as you might do as, you know, assuming that they're working class and these are the issues that they must organize around. Change takes place at a pace that is dictated by local constraints and local needs and it is motivated by local priorities. So change may begin with very practical concerns about bread and butter issues but as women get the confidence to organize, we see them moving into a much more political and strategic domain. Thank you. As Annie and Nyla are rather hard intellectual acts to follow, I thought I would end this evening on a personal note. I met Nyla in 1985 when she had just joined the Institute of Development Studies as a research officer. We got together, I remember, over a rather troublesome UNESCO project. I think we were both at sea in different ways at the time. Nyla was trying to find her feet in her first job, and I was trying to navigate the treacherous waters of Thatcherite higher education as an emigre academic. We had little inkling at the time of the many ways in which our paths would cross and recross, and how close our academic and political interests would eventually turn out to be but we rapidly established some common ground of an existential nature, not least 
that we were both single daughters with rather non-standard biographies for our respective countries, Bangladesh and Turkey. It was therefore not the powerful intellect you have seen displayed this evening that formed my first impressions of Nyla, but her mischievous chuckle, the twinkle in her eye, her vibrancy, and her love of fun. And of course, beyond all her wonderful achievements and her public persona, these will always endure, at least for me. Our paths have since crossed in very memorable ways. I was privileged to preside over the launch of our first book, Reverse Realities, a book that I would use as a textbook for my gender and development class for many, many years to come. When Nyla joined SOAS in 2009 upon my retirement, I felt a glow of satisfaction in the knowledge that the gender and development field was more than safe in her hands. May all my retiring colleagues be equally blessed. <laughs> Nyla, of course, brought much more to the department than the field of gender, although this evening we have mainly concentrated on the gender and development field. I have to mention here that she has worked very broadly in the development field, making critical contributions to the field of power, poverty, social safety nets, citizenship, her register is enormous, and I don't think it was fully reflected this evening. It would be fair to say that the two major architects of the field of gender and development as we know it today are right in this room. They are Annie Whitehead and Naila Kabir. There is hardly a groundbreaking concept in the field that does not bear their stamp. Nyla went even further by developing tools and instruments that could be used to inform development practice from project design and evaluation to macro level policy formulation. How did that happen? I think that Nyla was never afraid of getting her hands dirty. She entered into head-on engagement with the power institutions that define the parameters of contemporary development, multinationals like the World Bank, bilateral like, like DFID and many others, and numerous UN agencies. Now, although academics who work in the field of development have a great deal to say about these institutions, they often display a certain squeamishness, and I include myself in that number when it comes to taking them on directly and dialoguing about policy formulation and implementation. This is something Nyla did with great success. Many of the concepts and tools she developed were absorbed into the mainstream, and with that came a new challenge. As is often the case, this absorption carried the risk of blunting the radical edge of our proposals, which never stopped short of being transformative. And this ushered a period, a self-reflexive period of interrogation for those of us who are in the field of gender and development, looking at the decades behind us, what we have achieved, where we have fallen short, and what we must do next. So there is a sense in which this process of reflection in gender and development, which started with the foundational work of Nyla, Annie, and many others, took a new impetus, and it is still continuing. We are still engaged in this process of critical reflection, assessment, and reassessment. Now, what I also found quite interesting in Nyla's case was that at a time when academic feminism was threatening to turn into a mandarinate under the influence of post-structuralist and postmodern influences, Nyla had absolutely no time at all for approaches that had cut off their moorings from the struggles for social justice and equality that feminism had been a part of and remains a part of. She remained an activist at heart and an optimistic one at that because she always believed that resistance and transformation would eventually carry the day. May her wishes come true. 
I have never stood in the way of good food and good drink. So, uh, so I shall end by inviting me to join, to join me in my vote of thanks for Naila Kabir.